Attention all flight crew members, the flight is go for launch. Well, we're just days away from Starship's seventh launch, and it's a new year, and SpaceX is coming in hot. They have a lot of ambitions and some interesting things during this seventh launch. Now, keep in mind, this is still, of course, a flight test, and this will be launching a new generation ship. So this will be the version two of Starship with significant upgrades. Starship will also have its first payload deployment test and fly multiple re-entry experiments geared towards ship catch and reuse and of course launch and return the super heavy booster. So I wonder if 2025 will be the year that we see both the booster and the ship caught and reused. We'll have to see, but that will be probably an insanely busy launch. And honestly, I'm expecting this launch to be pretty busy because everyone wants to see that dang catch. So let's talk about the block of planned upgrades to the Starship upper stage. Those upgrades will be debuting on this test flight, bringing major improvements to reliability and performance. In fact, the vehicle's forward flaps have been reduced in size and shifted toward the vehicle tip and away from the heat shield, significantly reducing their exposure to re-entry heating while simplifying the underlying mechanisms and protective tiling. There have also been redesigns to the propulsion system, including a 25% increase in propellant volume, the vacuum jacketing of feed lines, a new fuel feed line system for the vehicle's Raptor vacuum engines, and an improved propulsion avionics module controlling vehicle valves and reading sensors. And all of these upgrades add additional vehicle performance and the ability to fly longer missions. The ship's heat shield will also use the latest generation tiles and includes a backup layer to protect from missing or damaged tiles. And the vehicle's avionics underwent a complete redesign, adding additional capability and redundancy for increasingly complex missions like propellant transfer and ship return to launch site. Avionics upgrades include a more powerful flight computer, integrated antennas which combine Starlink, GNSS, and backup RF communication functions into each unit, redesigning inertial navigation and star tracking sensors, integrated smart batteries and power units that distribute data and 2.7 megawatts of power across the ship to 21 high voltage actuators and an increase to more than 30 vehicle cameras. Wow, 30 vehicle cameras giving engineers insight into hardware performance across the vehicle during flight. With Starlink, the vehicle is capable of streaming more than 120 megabits per second of real time high definition video and telemetry in every phase of flight, providing invaluable engineering data to rapidly iterate across all systems. And I found this interesting. So SpaceX isn't quite ready to send out real Starlink satellites via Starship. In fact, the version two Starship was needed to deploy the next generation of Starlink satellites, but they're not quite ready to risk those expensive satellites. So they're going to be using some dummies. While in space, Starship will deploy 10 Starlink simulators similar in size and weight to next generation Starlink satellites as the first exercise of a satellite deploy mission. The Starlink simulators will be on the same suborbital trajectory as Starship with splashdown targeted in the Indian Ocean. And a relight of a single Raptor engine while in space is also planned and they did that on the last launch. The flight test will also include several experiments focused on ship return to launch site and catch. So we have those two towers for a reason. We ultimately want to be able to have the ship return and be reused as well. On Starship's upper stage, a significant number of tiles will be removed to stress test vulnerable areas across the vehicle. Multiple metallic tile options, including one with active cooling, will test alternative materials for protecting Starship during re-entry. And on the sides of the vehicle, non-structural versions of ship catch fittings are installed to test the fitting's thermal performance, along with a smoothed and tapered edge of the tile line to address hot spots observed during re-entry on Starship's sixth flight test. And we knew on the last flight test, the sixth one, that they did reduce the amount of tiles. And so this is interesting 
uh, information they're giving us. The ship's reentry profile is being designed to intentionally stress the structural limits of the flaps while at the point of maximum entry dynamic pressure. Finally, several radar sensors will be tested on the tower chopsticks with the goal of increasing the accuracy when measuring distances between the chopsticks and a returning vehicle during catch. The Super Heavy Booster will utilize flight-proven hardware for the first time, reusing a Raptor engine from the booster launched and returned on Starship's fifth flight test. Okay, there we go. Another really interesting thing for this seventh launch, they will be reusing a Raptor engine for the first time. And hardware upgrades to the launch and catch tower will increase reliability for booster catch, including protections to the sensors on the tower chopsticks that were damaged at launch and resulted in the booster offshore divert on Starship's previous flight test. So that's great. Those sensors on the tower on the top, we saw that they were bent. Um, hopefully won't get bent this time and we'll have that booster catch that I am craving so much. Now, as always, which it hasn't really been going on for that long. This is, you know, we've never seen a uh, rocket company catch a booster in a, a tower with chopsticks, but as usual, moving forward, distinct vehicle and pad criteria must be met prior to a return and catch of the super heavy booster, requiring healthy systems on the booster and tower and a final manual command from the mission's flight director. That's a lot of responsibility. If this command is not sent prior to the completion of a boost back burn or if automated health checks show unacceptable conditions with super heavy or the tower, the booster will default to a trajectory that takes it to a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico, which we saw last time. SpaceX says we accept no compromises when it comes to ensuring the safety of the public and our team, and the return will only take place if conditions are right. The returning booster will slow down from supersonic speeds, resulting in audible sonic booms in the area around the landing zone. Generally, the only impact to those in the surrounding area of a sonic boom is the brief thunder-like noise with variables like weather and distance from the return site determining the magnitude experienced by observers. And I will say I've seen every single Starship launch except for the fifth one, and the weather really does even have an impact on the sound of just the launch. You know, if it's super cloudy or foggy, um, these things can dampen the sound. And so it will surely affect the catch, and that should be louder. I really hope it happens. SpaceX says this new year will be transformational for Starship with the goal of bringing reuse of the entire system online and flying increasingly ambitious missions as we iterate toward being able to send humans and cargo to Earth orbit, the moon, and Mars. So let me know in the comments, do you think that this will be the year, 2025, that they will have the entire system online ready to be reused, including the ship, I think that, yeah, I think they could do it, but it's going to be uh, a really exciting year, a really busy year, and I I was in Seattle and Portland for the holidays, and I got back just in time for SpaceX to drop this new information on us, so hopefully you've enjoyed this video. I do plan to cover the launch, and hopefully you're able to tune in for that. Thank you so much for supporting my channel, and let's make it a great year. Thank you.